The Red Badge of Courage, an episode of the American Civil War, by Stephen Crane, Chapter One. The cold passed reluctantly from the earth, and the retiring fogs revealed an army stretched out on the hills, resting. As the landscape changed from brown to green, the army awakened, and began to tremble with eagerness at the noise of rumors. It cast its eyes upon the roads which were growing from long troughs of liquid mud to proper thoroughfares. A river, amber-tinted in the shadow of its banks, purled at the army's feet, and at night, when the stream had become of a sorrowful blackness, one could see across it the red eye-like gleam of hostile campfires set in the low brows of distant hills. Once a certain tall soldier developed virtues and went resolutely to wash his shirt. He came flying back from a brook, waving his garment banner-like. He was swelled with a tale he had heard from a reliable friend, who had heard it from a truthful cavalryman, who had heard it from his trustworthy brother, one of the orderlies at division headquarters. He adopted the important air of a herald in red and gold. "'We're going to move tomorrow, sure,' he said pompously to a group in the company street. "'We're going way up the river, cut across, and come around behind him. To his attentive audience he drew a loud and elaborate plan of a very brilliant campaign. When he had finished, the blue-cloth men scattered into small arguing groups between the rows of squat brown huts. A negro teamster who had been dancing upon a cracker-box with the hilarious encouragement of two-score soldiers was deserted. He sat mournfully down. Smoke drifted lazily from a multitude of quaint chimneys. "'It's a lie. That's all it is. Thunder and lie,' said another private loudly. His smooth face was flushed, and his hands were thrust sulkily into his trouser pockets. He took the matter as an affront to him. "'I don't believe the derned old army's ever going to move. We're set. I got ready to move eight times in the last two weeks, and we ain't moved yet.' The tall soldier felt called upon to defend the truth of a rumor he himself had introduced. He and the loud one came near to fighting over it. A corporal began to swear before the assemblage. He had just put a costly board floor in his house, he said. During the early spring he had refrained from adding extensively to the comfort of his environment, because he had felt that the army might start on the march at any moment. Of late, however, he had been impressed that they were in a sort of eternal camp. Many of the men engaged in a spirited debate. One outlined in a peculiarly lucid manner all the plans of the commanding general. He was opposed by men who advocated that there were other plans of campaign. They clambered each other, numbers making futile bids for the popular attention. Meanwhile, the soldier who had fetched the rumor bustled about with much importance. He was continually assailed by question. "'What's up, Jim? The army's going to move.' "'Ah, what are you talking about? How you know it is? "'Well, you can believe me or not, just as you like. I don't care a hang.' There was much food for thought in the manner in which he replied. He came near to convincing them by disdaining to produce proofs. They grew much excited over it. There was a youthful private who listened with eager ears to the words of the tall soldier, and to the very comments of his comrades. After receiving a fill of discussions concerning marches and attacks, he went to his hut and crawled through an intricate hole that served as a door. He wished to be alone with some new thoughts that had lately come to him. He lay down on a wide bunk that stretched across the end of the room. In the other end, cracker boxes were made to serve as furniture. They were grouped about the fireplace. A picture from an illustrated weekly was on the log walls, and three rifles were paralleled on pegs. Equipment hung on handy projections, and some tin dishes lay upon a small pile of firewood. A folded tent was serving as a roof. The sunlight without beating upon it made it glow a light yellow shade. A small window shot an oblique square of white light upon the cluttered floor. The smoke from the fire at times neglected the clay chimney, and wreathed into the room, and this flimsy chimney of clay and sticks made endless threats to set ablaze the whole establishment. The youth was in a little trance of astonishment. So they were at last going to fight. On the morrow, perhaps, there would be a battle, and he would be in it. For a time he was obliged to labor to make himself believe. He could not accept with assurance an omen that he was about to mingle in one of those great affairs of the earth. 
He had, of course, dreamed of battles all his life, of vague and bloody conflicts that had thrilled him with their sweep and fire. In visions he had seen himself in many struggles. He had imagined people secure in the shadow of his eagle-eyed prowess. But awake he had regarded battles as crimson blotches on the pages of the past. He had put them as things of the bygone with his thought images of heavy crowns and high castles. There was a portion of the world's history which he had regarded as the time of wars. But it, he thought, had been long gone over the horizon and had disappeared forever. From his home his youthful eyes had looked upon the war in his own country with distrust. It must be some sort of a play affair. He had long despaired of witnessing a Greek-like struggle. Such would be no more, he had said. Men were better and more timid. Secular and religious education had effaced the throat-grappling instinct, or else firm finance held in check the passions. He had burned several times to enlist. Tales of great movements shook the land. They might not be distinctly Homeric, but there seemed to be much glory in them. He had read of marches, sieges, conflicts, and he had longed to see it all. His busy mind had drawn him large pictures, extravagant in color, lurid with breathless deeds. But his mother had discouraged him. She had affected to look with some contempt on the quality of his war ador and patriotism. She could calmly seat herself and with no apparent difficulty give him many hundreds of reasons why he was of vastly more importance on the farm than on the field of battle. She had had certain ways of expression that told him that her statements on the subject came from a deep conviction. Moreover, on her side was his belief that her ethical motive in the argument was impregnable. At last, however, he had made firm rebellion against this yellow light thrown upon the color of his ambitions. The newspaper, the gossips of the village, his own picturings, had aroused him to an uncheckable degree. They were, in truth, fighting finely down there. Almost every day the newspapers printed accounts of a decisive victory. One night, as he lay in bed, the winds had carried to him clangoring of the church bell, as some enthusiast jerked the rope frantically to tell the twisted news of a great battle. This voice of the people rejoicing in the night had made him shiver in a prolonged ecstasy of excitement. Later he had gone down to his mother's room and had spoken thus. Ma, I'm going to enlist. Henry, don't you be a fool, his mother had replied. She had then covered her face with a the quilt. There was an end to that matter for the night. Nevertheless, the next morning he had gone to a town that was near his mother's farm and had enlisted in a company that was forming there. When he had returned home, his mother was milking the brindle cow. Four others stood waiting. Ma, huh? I've enlisted, he had said to her diffidently. There was a short silence. Lord's will be done, Henry, she had finally replied, and then continued to milk the brindle cow. When he had stood in the doorway with his soldier's clothes on his back, and with the light of excitement and expectancy in his eyes, almost defeating the glow of regret for the homebounds. He had seen two tears leaving their trails on his mother's scarred cheeks. Still she had disappointed him by saying nothing whatever about returning with his shield or on it. He had privately primed himself for a beautiful scene. He had prepared certain sentences which he thought could be used with touching effect. But her words destroyed his plans. She had doggedly peeled potatoes and addressed him as follows. You watch out, Henry, and take good care of yourself in this here fighting business. You watch out and take good care of yourself. Don't go thinking you can lick the whole rebel army at the start because you can't. You're just one little feller amongst a whole lot of others. And you've got to keep quiet and do what they tell you. I know how you are, Henry. I knit you eight pair of socks, Henry, and I put in all your best shirts, because I want my boy to be just as warm and comfortable as anybody in the Army. Whenever they get holes in them, I want you to send them right away back to me so as I can darn them. And always be careful and choose your company. There's lots of bad men in the Army, Henry. The Army makes them wild, and they like nothing better than the job of leading off a young feller like you as ain't never been away from home much and as all's had a mother, and a learnin' em to drink and swear. Keep clear of them folks, Henry. I don't want yer to ever do anything, Henry, that you wouldn't be shamed to let me know about. Just think as if I was a-watchin' you. 
If you keep that in your mind, Alice, I guess you'll come out about all right. You must always remember your father, too, child, and remember he never drunk a drop of liquor in his life, and seldom swore a cross oath. I don't know what else to tell you, Henry, exceptin' that you must never do no shirking, child, on my account. If so be a time comes when ye have to be killed or do a mean thing, why, Henry, don't think of anything except what's right, because there's many a woman has to bear up against such things these times, and the Lord'll take care of us all. Don't forget about the socks and the shirts, child, and I put a cup of blackberry jam with your bundle because I know you like it above all things. Goodbye, Henry. Watch out and be a good boy. He had, of course, been impatient under the ordeal of this speech. It had not been quite what he expected, and he bore it with an air of irritation. He departed feeling vague relief. Still, when he had looked back from the gate, he had seen his mother kneeling among the potato peelings, her brown face upraised, stained with tears, and her spare form quivering. He bowed his head and went on feeling suddenly ashamed of his purposes. From his home he had gone to the seminary to bid adieu to his many schoolmates. They had thronged about him with wonder and admiration. He had felt a gulf now between them and had swelled with calm pride. He and some of his fellows who had donned the blue were quite overwhelmed with privileges for all of one afternoon, and it had been a very delicious thing. They had strutted. A certain light-haired girl had made vivacious fun at his martial spirit, but there was another and darker girl whom he gazed at steadfastly, and he thought she grew demure and sad at sight of his blue and brass. As he had walked down the path between the rows of oaks, he had turned his head and detected her at a window, watching his departure. As he perceived her, she had immediately begun to stare up through the high tree branches at the sky. He had seen a good deal of flurry and haste in her movements as she changed her attitude. He often thought of it. On the way to Washington, his spirit had soared. The regiment was fed and caressed at station after station, until the youth had believed that he must be a hero. There was a lavish expenditure of bread and cold meats, coffee and pickles and cheese. As he basked in the smiles of the girls, and was patted and complimented by the old men, he had felt growing with him him the strength to do mighty deeds of arms. After complicated journeyings with many pauses, there had come months of monotonous life in a camp. He had had the belief that real war was a series of death struggles with small time in between for sleep and meals, but since his regiment had come to the field the army had done little but sit still and try to keep warm. He was brought then gradually back to his old ideas. Greek-like struggles would be no more. Men were better, or more timid. Secular and religious education had affected the throat-grappling instinct, or else firm finance held in check the passions. He had grown to regard himself merely as a part of a vast blue demonstration. His province was to look out, as far as he could, for his personal comfort. For recreation he could twiddle his thumbs and speculate on the thoughts which must agitate the minds of the generals. Also he was drilled and drilled and reviewed and drilled and drilled and reviewed. The only foes he had seen were some pickets along the river bank. They were a sun-tanned philosophical lot, who sometimes shot reflectively at the blue pickets. When reproached for this afterward, they usually expressed sorrow and swore by their gods that the guns had exploded without their permission. The youth on guard duty one night conversed across the stream with one of them. He was a slightly ragged man who spat skillfully between his shoes and possessed a great fund of bland and infantile assurance. The youth liked him personally. Yank, the other had informed him, you're a right damn good feller. This sentiment floating to him upon the still air had made him temporarily regret war. Various veterans had told him tales. Some talked of gray bewhiskered hordes who were advancing with relentless curses and chewing tobacco with unspeakable valor. Tremendous bodies of fierce soldiery who were sweeping along like the Huns. 
Others spoke of tattered and eternally hungry men who fired despondent powders. They'll charge through hell's fire and brimstone to get a hold of a haverstack, and such stomachs ain't a lastin' long, he was told. From the stories the youth imagined the red, live bones sticking out through slits in the faded uniforms. Still he could not put a whole faith in veterans' tales, for recruits were their prey. They talked much of smoke, fire, and blood, but he could not tell how much might be lies. They persistently yelled, "'Fresh fish!' at him, and were in no wise to be trusted. However, he perceived now that it did not greatly matter what kind of soldiers he was going to fight, so long as they fought, which fact no one disputed. There was a more serious problem. He lay on his bunk, pondering upon it. He tried to mathematically prove to himself that he would not run from a battle. Previously he had never felt obliged to wrestle too seriously with this question. In his life he had taken certain things for granted never challenging his belief in ultimate success, and bothering little about means and roads. But here he was, confronted with a thing of moment. It had suddenly appeared to him that perhaps in a battle he might run. He was forced to admit that as far as war was concerned he knew nothing of himself. A sufficient time before he would have allowed the problem to kick its heels at the outer portals of his mind, but now he felt compelled to give serious attention to it. A little panic fear grew in his mind. As his imagination went forward to a fight, he saw hideous possibilities. He contemplated the lurking menaces of the future, and failed in an effort to see himself standing stoutly in the midst of them. He recalled his visions of broken, bladed glory, but in the shadow of the impending tumult he suspected them to be impossible pictures. He sprang from the bunk and began to pace nervously to and fro. "'Good Lord! What's the matter with me?' he said aloud. He felt that in this crisis his laws of life were useless. Whatever he had learned of himself was here of no avail. He was an unknown quantity. He saw that he would again be obliged to experiment as he had in early youth. He must accumulate information of himself, and meanwhile— he resolved to remain close upon his guard, lest those qualities of which he knew nothing should everlastingly disgrace him. "'Good Lord!' he repeated in dismay. After a time the tall soldier slid dexterously through the hole. The loud private followed. They were wrangling. "'That's all right,' said the tall soldier, as he entered. He waved his hand expressively. "'You can believe me or not, just as you like.' All you got to do is sit down and wait as quiet as you can. Then pretty soon you'll find out I was right. His comrade grunted stubbornly. For a moment he seemed to be searching for a formidable reply. Finally he said, Well, you don't know everything in the world, do you? Didn't say I knew everything in the world, retorted the other sharply. He began to stow various articles snugly into his knapsack. The youth, pausing in his nervous walk, looked down at the busy figure. "'Going to be a battle, sure, is there, Jim?' he asked. "'Of course there is,' replied the tall soldier. "'Of course there is. You just wait till tomorrow, and you'll see one of the biggest battles ever was. Just wait.' "'Thunder,' said the youth. "'Oh, you'll see fighting this time, my boy. What'll be regular out-and-out -out fighting,' added the tall soldier, with an air of a man who is about to exhibit a battle for the benefit of his friends. "'Huh?' said the loud one in the corner. Well, remarked the youth, like as not, this story'll turn out just like them others did. Not much it won't, replied the tall soldier, exasperated. Not much it won't. Didn't the cavalry all start this morning? He glared about him. No one denied his statement. The cavalry started this morning, he continued. They say there are hardly any cavalry in the camp. They're going to Richmond or some place while we fight all the Johnnies. It's some dodge like that. The regiment got orders, too. A feller what seen him go to headquarters told me a little while ago, and they're raising blazes all over the camp. Anybody can see that. Shucks, said the loud one. The youth remained silent for a time. At last he spoke to the tall soldier. Jim? What? How do you think the regiment will do? Ah, oh, they'll fight all right. I guess after they once get into it, 
said the other one with cold judgment. He made a fine use of the third person. There'd been heaps of fun poked at em because they're new, of course, and all that, but they'll fight all right, I guess. Think any of the boys'll run? persisted the youth. Oh, there may be a few of em run, but there's them kind in every regiment, especially when they first goes under fire, said the other in a tolerant way. Of course, it might happen that the whole kitten caboodle might start and run if some big fightin' come first off, and then again they might stay and fight like fun. But you can't bet on nothin'. But of course they ain't never been under fire yet. And it ain't likely they'll lick the whole rebel army all once first time. But I think they'll fight better than some, if worse than others. That's the way I figure. They call the regiment fresh fish and everything. But the boys come of good stock, and most of all fight, like sin after they once get shootin', he added with a mighty emphasis on the last four words. Ah, uh, you think you know, began the loud soldier with scorn. The other turned savagely upon him. They had a rapid altercation in which they fastened upon each other various strange epithets. The youth at last interrupted them. Did you ever think you might run yourself, Jim? <laughs> he asked. On concluding the sentence, he laughed as if he had meant to aim a joke. The loud soldier also giggled. The tall private waved his hand. Well, he said profoundly, I thought it might get too hot for Jim Conklin in some of them scrimmages, and if a whole lot of boys started to run away, I suppose I'd start and run. And if I once started to run, I'd run like the devil and no mistake. But if everybody was a standin' and a fightin', why, I'd stand and fight. Be Jiminy, I would. I'll bet on it. Ha! <laughs> said the loud one. The youth of this tale felt gratitude for these words of his comrade. He had feared that all of the untried men possessed a great and correct confidence. He now was in a measure reassured. End of chapter 1